Hello everyone and welcome back to the Dungeon Learner's Guide. This week we've got another Commander's Guild deck tech. This is deck number 180 and it's titled The Lost Oracle. And if you haven't seen the show before, what we're doing is randomly selecting a card from scryfall.com or from among suggested cards, working with a budget of $100 or less and building a commander deck for Magic the Gathering around a theme of the chosen card. So this week our random card was suggested to us by Vintage over on Discord slash Patreon. And that card is Oracle's Vault. And Oracle's Vault is four mana for an artifact. You can pay two, tap it, exile the top card of your library. Until the end of turn, you may play that card, put a brick counter on Oracle's Vault, or tap, exile the top card of your library. Until the end of turn, you may play that card without paying its mana cost. Activate only if there are three or more brick counters on Oracle's Vault. So, this was suggested to us as kind of a build around in the sense that there was a suggested card, but Vintage also had a bit of an idea for a commander. And so he asked me if we could build Oracle's Vault, but he also asked if we could build around a specific commander. So while I'm including the random card to be Oracle's Vault, he did also request the commander of the deck, but it felt more in line with the pacing of this to put it in the actual commander slot. And that card is Fibblethip Lost on the Range. So Fibblethip is one blue-blue for a 1-1 one, one legendary creature homunculus. He has Ward 2. You may look at the top card of your library at any time. The top card of your library has Plot. The Plot cost is equal to its mana cost. And you may plot non-land cards from the top of your library. So this is a very unique card, but it plays well with um, Oracle's Vault because it's going to be caring about the top card of our library. And this gives us the ability to look at the top card of our library so we can know if we want to activate Oracle's Vault or not. And it also lets us play in some very unique spaces with the other cards in this deck. So let's move on and talk about some of our themes for this deck and what we're really trying to build around. The first of our major themes is going to be plot cards. And more specifically, we're focused on some plot cards that already have plot. But for the most part, we really do just want to plot anything and everything. But to give you an example of what plotting looks like, we have Lone Shark, which is three and a blue for a three, four shark rogue. When it enters the battlefield, if you've cast two or more spells this turn, draw a card, and it has plot for three and a blue, which means that we can pay three and a blue, exile it from our hand, and then we can cast it as a sorcery on a later turn without paying its mana cost. But Notably, we can only plot it as a sorcery, and we can also only cast it as a sorcery. That is something to be aware of as you're playing this deck. We do run some counter spells because we're in blue, so we may as well take advantage of the stack interaction. But if you plot a counter spell, you can only cast it at sorcery speed, which means it's going to be doing literally nothing the rest of the game. So that is something to be aware of. Moving on to our next major theme, we're going to talk a little bit about specifically casting things from exile. Since Lone Shark and other plot cards get exiled and then we can cast them later, we want to take advantage of cards that say when you cast something from exile or when you cast something from anywhere other than your hand, because that is going to be a lot of what we're trying to do. So a good example of that is Extraordinary Journey. It's XX blue blue for an enchantment. When it enters the battlefield, exile up to X target creatures. For each of those cards, its owner may play it for as long as it remains exiled. So it's removal if we need it or just a two mana enchantment if we don't. Whenever one or more non-token creatures enter the battlefield, if one or more of them entered from exile or was cast from exile, you draw a card. This ability triggers only once each turn. So essentially, we could then plot Lone Shark, cast another spell, of course, because Lone Shark does need to be two or more spells. We can then cast Lone Shark from Exile, and then, since it's entering from Exile, we're going to draw a card with Extraordinary Journey. Then when Lone Shark enters, we'll draw another card, since it's the second spell we've cast this turn. Essentially drawing us two cards and replacing both Lone Shark and Extraordinary Journey, which is pretty efficient and a very useful way to generate card advantage in a deck that and if we're being perfectly honest, does not struggle for card advantage. And then moving into our final theme of the deck, this is going to be 
card draw. And more specifically, since we're drawing so many cards, it's card draw payoffs. So for example, we have Nadir Kraken, which is one blue blue for a 2-3 Kraken. Whenever you draw a card, you may pay one. If you do, put a plus one plus one counter on Nadir Kraken and create a 1-1 one, one blue tentacle creature token. So this is a great way to benefit us when we're drawing a ton of cards, and it also helps us take advantage of some extra mana that we may have laying around because we've already plotted all of our spells, which means we can cast them all for free on a later turn. So we could cast three, four, five spells, draw a bunch of different cards, and then still have mana left over to pay for Nadir Kraken, making it super big, making a ton of tentacles, and it's a great way to benefit us from really just playing the game, because we want to be drawing cards, we want to be casting spells, and then of course we need some creatures to make sure that we can actually win the game. So those are our themes for this week, and the next thing we're going to have to do is take a look at some key cards. These are the cards that really synergize with what we're trying to do, and in some cases are value engines, win conditions, or maybe just really cool cards that I think work well in this deck. So the very first card I want to talk about is going to be Surge of Brilliance, which is one in a blue for an instant. It has Paradox, draw a card for each spell you've cast this turn from anywhere other than your hand, and it has Foretell for one in a blue, so we can exile it face down for two mana and then cast it later on for its Foretell cost. Now, we don't really care if we Foretell this or if we plot it. If we're being perfectly honest, we usually want to plot it because then it's two mana instead of four, but it still works either way. So worst case scenario, we cast this from exile and then draw one card because we cast one card from exile. More likely what's going to happen is we're going to plot four, five, six cards and then cast all six of those cards from exile and then we're able to cast Surge of Brilliance and draw six cards for only two mana, which is incredibly efficient very effective and it's one of the ways that we can generate a huge burst of card advantage and while we're plotting cards face up and our opponents are most likely going to know what we're doing, it's still relevant because they aren't going to know the cards that are in our hand and they might not know of Surge of Brilliance if we foretell it rather than plot it. So that is key card number one. Moving into key card number two, we're going to talk about Outlaw Stitcher. So one of the main things that we struggle with with this deck is having big creatures. A lot of times we just have one ones like Fibblethip, maybe one fours like Outlaw Stitcher, but we want to find ways to make giant creatures too because that's going to be one of the quickest ways we can end the game. So Outlaw Stitcher is three and a blue for a one four human warlock. It also has plot naturally for four and a blue. We're going to try to plot it for three and a blue instead with Fibblethip. But when it enters the battlefield, you make a 2-2 blue and black zombie rogue creature token, then put two plus one plus one counters on that token for each spell you've cast this turn other than the first. So if we cast, say, five spells, we get to put ten plus one plus one counters on the creature. It's already a 2-2, now it's a 12-12. That's really going to speed up the clock as the game goes on, and ideally we will have enough creatures in play that our opponents are going to struggle to block all of them, so if they have to throw things under a 12-12 to make sure that our 5-1-1s can get through, we're still speeding up the clock on our opponent's life totals, and we're still pressuring them to a point that we're eventually going to be winning the game. So... Outlaw Stitcher seems a little bit weird at first glance, but it really is incredibly powerful in this deck because we, for lack of a better term, do kind of want to just storm off on our turn and cast as many spells as possible. Now, moving into our final key card, we're going to talk a little bit about Proft's Eidetic Memory. This is the main win condition in the deck. It is one in a blue for a legendary enchantment. When it enters the battlefield, draw a card. You have no maximum hand size. And at the beginning of combat on your turn, if you've drawn more than one card this turn, put X plus one plus one counters on target creature you control, where X is the number of cards you've drawn this turn minus one. So notably, if we have only drawn a card for our turn and then go to combat, this will do nothing because we've drawn only one card. So we have one plus one plus one counter minus one turns into zero. 
But if we do something like Surge of Brilliance and draw six cards, we then move to combat and put six plus one plus one counters on a creature, turning maybe our zombie rogue that was already a 12-12 into an 18-18, turning Outlaw Stitcher into a one power creature to a seven power creature. This gives us the ability to make Fibblethip into a really dangerous attacker because he can go from a 1-1 to a 7-7 very, very quickly, and then it's just three hits to knock someone out of the game. Plus, he's got Ward 2, so he's difficult to interact with. But Prof's Eidetic Memory really is like the win condition of the deck. All we want to do is cast spells and draw cards. And so if Prof's Eidetic Memory can give us a win condition as we're just playing our deck, that is absolutely perfect for what we're trying to do. But those are all of our key cards, and the next thing we're going to have to do is take a look at some cool interactions in this deck. And these are cards that synergize very well with each other, and in some cases can be win conditions or value engines all on their own. So our very first cool interaction is going to be between Reenact the Crime and Mind's Desire. So Reenact the Crime is a personal favorite card of mine. It is one blue 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 for an instant. Exile target non-land card in a graveyard that was put there from anywhere this turn. Copy it. You may cast the copy without paying its mana cost. So this allows us to cast anything that went into our graveyard this turn, or any opponent's graveyard, maybe if they have something big that we want to take as well. So, what's the biggest thing we can take in our deck? That is Mind's Desire. For four blue-blue, it's a sorcery. Shuffle your library. Then exile the top card of your library, and until end of turn you may play that card without paying its mana cost, plus the all-important keyword text of Storm. So when we cast it, we copy it for each spell cast before it this turn. So say we have just 10 mana, so we only have enough mana to cast Mind's Desire and reenact the crime and nothing else, we can cast Mind's Desire, there's no Storm, so we just get the one effect. We exile the top card of our library. Hopefully it is a non-land card. We can cast it. Then we can cast Reenact the Crime, targeting Mind's Desire to cast it again. And at this point, our storm count is up to four, which means we would then copy it three additional times and get four more copies of Mind's Desire just from having these two cards. And of course, hopefully we're at the point in the game where we've plotted a bunch of stuff, so we may be able to get our storm count even higher. It's not unlikely in this deck for Storm Count to regularly get over double digits, pushing 10, 15, maybe even 20 in a turn, because that is what this deck is designed to do. And this is one of the most efficient ways to either start or end that loop, because Mind's Desire plus Reenact the Crime is essentially just two copies of Mind's Desire, which can be absolutely game-ending. But that is only cool interaction number one. We still have a second cool interaction to talk about, and this one is going to be between Epocrisite and Future Sight. So Epocrisite is a card that I think has gotten a lot more value in recent years because they've been printing a lot of cards that care about exile. It is two mana for a 1-1 one, one artifact creature construct, but it enters the battlefield with three plus one plus one counters on it if you didn't cast it from your hand, and when it dies, exile it with three time counters on it, and it gains Suspend. So essentially, this could be a two-mana 4-4, four, four, which isn't amazing by any stretch of the imagination, but it's a two-mana 4-4 four, four that keeps coming back. And since we have so many ways to cast cards from Exile or from the top of our library, it's almost always in our deck going to be a two-mana 4-4. Four, four. Most likely, that's going to be with cards like Future Sight, which is two blue, blue, blue for an enchantment that says we play with the top card of our library revealed, and we may play the top card of our library. So Fibblethip lets us plot it so we can do it later, so if we want to have one big value turn, Fibblethip is going to be better. But using Future Sight to get things like Apocrisite or maybe get some value off the top of our deck while we're kind of waiting for the engine to kick in, that is still going to be incredibly efficient and powerful as we go through the game. So I did just want to highlight these two cards because I think they both work well in the deck separately, but I also think that they're very powerful together. Moving in, though, to our final piece of this deck tech, we want to take a look at the price of the deck. And this week, our total deck price came out to $65.62, which is pretty cheap, all things considered. It's a little over halfway of our budget limit of $100. 
and a good portion of that actually comes from our most expensive card, which is Counterbalance. And Counterbalance is a blue-blue enchantment. Whenever an opponent plays a spell, you may reveal the top card of your library. If you do, counter that spell if it has the same mana value as the revealed card for a massive $13.62. So this card is incredibly effective in our deck because Fibbletip allows us to look at the top card of our library. We have things like Future Sight that play with the top card of our library revealed. We have a lot of ways of knowing what the top card of our deck is meaning we can always make the decision if we want to counter something and our opponents cast a spell that shares a mana value with the top card of our library. Now, obviously, if we have Future Sight and our opponents can also see the top card of our library, it's going to be pretty easy for them to avoid it. But if we just have Fibbletip and are looking at the top card, there's no real way for them to know if at any point we could counter their spells essentially for free, because we don't really care if they see the top card of our library, because we're intending to show it to them anyway when we plot it. So Counterbalance is incredibly powerful in this deck, but like I said, it is $13, so if you do need to trim it, you could get the deck price down to about $50, which is much more manageable. But it does mean that you don't have nearly as much interaction or protection or things like that. So if you are capable of keeping it in, I would highly recommend it. On the other hand, if you're looking for a card to put into the deck that's a little outside of our budget limit, then I do have a suggestion for you there as well. And this week, our out-of-budget suggestion would be Sensei's Divining Top. And if you're going to put in Sensei's Divining Top, you got to take out another card, and that would be Bag of Holding. So Sensei's Divining Top, which is a massive $26.63, is actually perfect for this deck because it's one mana for an artifact. You can pay one, look at the top three cards of your library, then put them back in any order. Perfect for if we want to be plotting. And we can tap it to draw a card and put Sensei's Divining Top on top of its owner's library. So if we see that we have something like, say, a counterspell on top of our deck and we know we can't plot that because it's going to be useless, we can actually just replace it with Sensei's Divining Top, plot the Divining Top so we can cast it again next turn, maybe plot something that's underneath it, and then we have the counterspell in our hand to be able to protect Fibblethip or when we try to storm off and things like that. Now, if you are, like I said earlier, putting a card in, you would have to take a card out, and it actually works out pretty well that if we're trying to put in a one-mana artifact, we can take out another one-mana artifact in Bag of Holding, which says whenever you discard a card, exile that card from your graveyard, then you can pay two and tap it to draw a card and discard a card, and pay four, tap it, and sacrifice it to return all cards exiled with Bag of Holding to their owner's hand. Now, Originally, when I put this deck together, I expected we would be discarding to hand size quite a bit, which is why I thought Bag of Holding was going to be incredibly efficient. However, after playtesting, that's not actually the case. We have so many ways in this deck to generate card advantage, and a lot of ways that don't really put the cards into our hand. When we're drawing a ton of cards in one big turn, that's usually the turn we want to try to win the game, or it's a turn that we've already hit the point in the game where we have no maximum hand size. So while I think Bag of Holding is a good card, and it can still do good things in this deck, it's actually less effective than you might expect, given the fact that we draw so many cards, because we don't actually discard that often. So if you do have a choice between these two and budget isn't an issue, or maybe you just have a Divining Top laying around, I would recommend using that instead of the Bag of Holding. However, for budget purposes, if you do still want to use Bag of Holding, it is a perfectly viable card in this deck. Now, with all of that being said, and before we get into a game, because of course we gotta check out how this deck performs in a game, I want to take a second to highlight some of the ways that you can help support the channel if that's something you're interested in doing. So as always, you can just like the video and subscribe to the channel. That is amazing and it helps out a ton. I'm really pushing to try to get us to 1,500 subscribers by the end of the year, so if you could help us get there, that would be awesome. Double check, see if you're actually subscribed. I know a lot of our viewers are not. In fact, about 80% of our viewers aren't. So double check to see if you are. I would really appreciate you hitting that subscribe button. But otherwise, 
If you would like to join our amazing patrons and channel members, you can do so. There are plenty of sweet things you get from that, such as a Discord where we brew up the videos and also play the games that are on the channel, so you can always show up on the channel. You get the deck lists a week early. You get the guarantee that any suggestion will be turned into a YouTube video eventually. But as always, I do have to give a quick shout out to all of our current patrons and channel members. So a huge thank you goes out to William Swiftfoot, Doodle, Eric Huey, Jeff Winger, Jeffrey Boos, Salty and Sunshine, Tyler Esme, Sven van Nimwigen, Patty Wack, Devin Purser, Brian Haney, Keegan Tawney, Elias Meza, and Jakar. So to all of you, thank you all so much for all of your support, and if you would like your name to be listed among these amazing people, please do check us out on Patreon or right here on YouTube as a channel member. So with all of that being said, let's move on to our game and see how this deck actually performs. So this week we are joined by three opponents as we test out our Fibblethip Lost Oracle deck, and that is going to be Luke playing Morit of the Frost, we have Paul playing Grevin Predator Captain, and we have Doodle playing a Layla Artful Provocateur. So starting off with Luke and his Morit deck, this is actually a Simic Pinger deck, so he wants to load his deck up with any creature that can tap to do one damage to any target, but he specifically does not want to be targeting his opponent's things. He wants to ping his own things for value. It could be things that prevent damage, it could get value when they're dealt damage, and really it's just a very unique strategy, and I'm very interested to see how it goes. He's been talking about this deck for quite a while, so I'm very excited to see some of the cuts that he may have had to make and what actually makes the deck function. Moving on to Grevin being played by Paul. This is a deck that we've seen a couple of times on the channel, not Paul's specific version, but Grevin in general. It is a very powerful commander, and I think out of all three of our opponents, this is the one that I am the most concerned about because it's not unlikely for Grevin to attack and just magically have their controller lose, say, 21 life, and then Grevin gets plus 21 and then knocks somebody out with commander damage. So that is a concern going into this. We don't have a ton of ways to prevent the attacks. We really just have to focus on keeping Grevin either off the field or putting enough creatures in the way that we can block him if need be. But like I said, probably the biggest concern for me at the table. Next up, and last but not least, we have Doodle playing Alayla. And normally when you see Alayla, it is artifacts, it's enchantments, it really just wants to cast as many of those in a turn as possible. Doodle's build is actually more about flying creatures. Because Alayla gives plus one plus oh to flyers, he wants to focus on just dropping as many flyers into play as possible and using them to just beat down his opponents. So... I mentioned that Grevin was the most concerning. I do think Alayla is a very close second, mainly because we don't have a ton of ways to protect against flyers. If anything, though, I don't think our opponents do either, so that may work in our favor where we can kind of convince Grevin and Morit to focus down Alayla, and then maybe we can sneak in and steal a victory, but we'll have to see. I'm a little concerned because a lot of our creatures do tend to be on the smaller side, and, you know, pingers can do pretty well against 1-1 creatures. So overall, I think this is going to be a pretty rough game for Fibblethip. I don't think it's unwinnable by any means, but it's definitely going to be a fight to get there. So let's see how we do. Let me know down in the comments if you have any predictions for this video. Let me know which deck you think is going to walk out the winner. But otherwise, I hope you enjoyed the deck tech. I hope you will enjoy the video. I'm sure I certainly will. And I will talk to you all once it's done. At the start of the game, Luke goes first, followed by Paul, Doodle, and then myself. On Luke's turn, he plays a Thornwood Falls, gaining a life. Paul plays a Foreboding Ruins. Doodle plays a Tranquil Cove, gaining a life. I play an Island, cast a Soul Ring, and also cast Bag of Holding. Luke plays a forest and casts three visits, searching his library for Rhymewood Falls, putting it into play tapped. Paul plays a swamp. Doodle plays a swamp and casts Ornithopter of Paradise. I play an island and cast my commander, Fibblethip Lost on the Range, letting me look at and plot the top card of my library. 
Luke plays a hinterland harbor and cast Apprentice Sorcerer, which can tap to deal a damage to any target, but only on Luke's turn before combat. Paul casts Key to the City, which can tap to make a creature unblockable until the end of turn, and lets him pay two mana when it untaps to draw a card. Then he plays a Rakdos Carnarium, returning a swamp to his hand. Doodle casts a Jubilant Skybonder, making spells his opponents cast that target his flying creatures cost two more. Then he plays an Azorius Chancery, returning Tranquil Cove to his hand. On my turn I play an Island and plot High Tide from the top of my library, and also plot Vesuvian Drifter from the top of my library. I then move to combat and attack Paul for one with Fibblethip, but before damage, Paul activates Key to the City, discarding a card and targeting Fibblethip, but the ability to make it unblockable is countered by Ward. Luke plays a Forest and taps the Apprentice Sorcerer to do one damage to Fibblethip, paying for Ward, killing my commander. After that, he casts Zurin Spellcaster, which can tap to do a damage to any target. When Paul untaps for turn, he pays two mana for Key to the City, drawing a card, then plays a Swamp. On Doodle's turn, he replays Tranquil Cove, gaining a life, then attacks me for two with Jubilant Skybonder. I play an Island and cast Wandering Archaic, letting me copy any instant or sorcery an opponent casts unless they pay two mana. Luke plays a Yavimaya Coast and casts Vigor, preventing all damage that would be dealt to his other creatures, and putting that many plus one plus one counters on them instead. He then uses Apprentice Sorcerer to do one damage to Vigor, putting a plus one plus one counter on it. Notably, Vigor wouldn't get the counter on itself because its ability only applies to other creatures, but we don't catch that at the time. Paul plays a Mountain and casts his commander Grevin Predator Captain, then at the end of turn, Doodle flashes in Thunderclap Wyvern, giving all his other creatures with flying plus one plus one. Then on Doodle's turn, he plays a Swamp and casts his commander, a Layla Artful Provocateur, letting him make a 1-1 Fairy Token whenever he casts an artifact or enchantment, and also gives his other creatures with flying plus one plus O. Oh. He then casts a Sky Diamond, making a Fairy Token, and moves to combat, attacking Luke and Paul both for four. On my turn, I recast my commander, Fibblethip, and this lets me plot Personal Tutor from the top of my library, then I play a Remote Isle, and pass. On Luke's turn, he casts Psionic Gift, Enchanting Vigor, letting it tap to do one damage to any target, then he casts Soul Ring, followed by casting Rampant Growth, not paying for Walking Archaic, so I get to copy it, letting both Luke and I search our libraries for a basic land, putting it into play tapped. Before combat, Luke uses all three of his pingers to do three damage to Thunderclap Wyvern, killing it. On Paul's turn, he plays a Ghost Quarter, then cast Mimic Vat, letting him exile any creature that dies and tap the Vat to create a token copy of it that is exiled at the end of turn. Then he also casts Zayara, Widow of the Realm, which he immediately sacrifices to Grevin when he attacks Luke, drawing three cards, losing three life, and giving Grevin plus three plus O, oh, hitting Luke for eight total damage. Notably, he also exiles Zayara with the Mimic Vat. On Doodle's turn, he plays a Temple of Silence, scrying one, then casts Curiosity Crafter, letting him draw a card whenever a token he controls deals combat damage to an opponent. He then attacks me for four with a Layla and a Fairy token, and in his second main phase, Doodle casts Chrome Courier, making a Fairy token and looking at the top two cards of his library, putting one into his hand and the other into his graveyard. On my turn, I plot Surge of Brilliance from the top of my library, and also plot Rapid Hybridization from the top of my library. 
After that, I cast Future Sight, making me play with the top card of my library revealed and letting me play it, which I immediately do, playing Myriad Landscape from the top of my library. On Luke's turn, he cast Pirate Ship, which can tap to do 1 damage to any target. Then before combat, he activates Apprentice Sorcerer, doing 1 damage to Vigor and putting a plus 1 plus 1 counter on it. This lets him actually go to combat and attack Doodle for 9 with Vigor. On Paul's turn, he plays a Temple of Malice, scrying 1, and casts Cathartic Reunion, discarding 2 cards and drawing 3. He then cast Mark of Mutiny, letting me copy it with Wandering Archaic, and that means that Paul and I both get to gain control of target creature until the end of turn, putting a plus one plus one counter on it. This has Paul taking Vigor, while I take Chrome Courier. Once that resolves, Paul casts Vampiric Link, enchanting Greven, letting Paul gain life equal to the damage Greven deals, then attacks Doodle with Greven, sacrificing Vigor, exiling it with Mimic Fat, drawing nine cards, losing nine life, giving Greven plus 9 plus 0. Doodle is able to block with the Skybonder and a Fairy Token, killing all three creatures, but taking no damage, while Paul gains 14 life and exiles Greven with Mimic Vat. On Doodle's turn, he plays an Island and casts Una, Queen of the Fae. He then attacks Paul for 5 with a Fairy Token and the Chrome Courier, drawing a card. On my turn, I play an island from the top of my library, then cast Arcane Signet and plot Brainstorm from the top of my library, as well as plotting Outlaw Stitcher from the top of my library. After that, I go to combat and attack Paul for four with the Wandering Archaic. On Luke's turn, he plays an island and casts his commander, Moret of the Frost, entering as a copy of Pirate Ship, except it also has an additional two plus one plus one counters. He then moves to combat and attacks me for four with the Pirate Ship. On Paul's turn, he plays a Tainted Peak and casts Corpse Explosion, exiling Daring Fiendbonder from his graveyard to do five damage to each creature. In response, Doodle activates Una for X equals 2, exiling the top two cards of Paul's library and making a fairy token for each red card exiled, which is 1, and then it dies to the board wipe along with everything else. This also lets Paul exile Wandering Archaic with Mimic Fat, after we realize that the copy of Greven wouldn't deal commander damage. Once that resolves, Paul casts Greed, which lets him pay a black mana and 2 life to draw a card. Doodle plays a Plains and casts Kangi Sky Warden, which gives his flying creatures plus 2 plus 0 whenever it attacks, and plus 0 plus 2 whenever it blocks. He also casts Errant and Giada, letting him look at and cast the top card of his library as long as it has Flash or Flying. At the end of turn, I sacrifice my Myriad Landscape to search my library for two basic lands, putting them into play tapped. Then, on my turn, I play an island from the top of my library and recast my commander Fibblethip before plotting Lantern of Insight from the top of my library and casting Oddsgood Operation Double, creating a non-legendary copy of it as it enters, letting me investigate whenever I cast a spell from anywhere other than my hand. On Luke's turn, he cast Rootwater Hunter, which can tap to deal 1 damage to any target. Paul casts a Rakdos Signet, and also casts Mask of Grizzlebrand. Doodle casts a Windrider Sphinx, letting him draw a card whenever a creature with flying attacks. He then attacks me for 9 with Kangi and Errant and Giada, also drawing 2 cards. In his second main phase, Doodle plays an Island and casts Watcher of the Spheres, making his flying creatures cost 1 less to cast. On my turn, I cast Lantern of Insight from Exile, making each player play with the top card of their library revealed, and creating two clues. In response, Paul activates Mimic Vat, making a token copy of Wandering Archaic. Then I cast High Tide from Exile, making two clues, and letting all islands tap for an additional mana, but Paul chooses not to copy the spell. I also cast Vesuvian Drifter from Exile, making two more clues, 
and then sacrifice a clue to draw a card, and cast Rapid Hybridization from Exile, making two clues, paying two mana so Paul doesn't copy it, and destroying the Wandering Archaic, replacing it with a 3-3 Frog Lizard. I then cast Personal Tutor from Exile, making two more clues and searching my library for a sorcery, specifically Mind's Desire, putting it on top of my deck. After that I cast Brainstorm from Exile, making two more clues, drawing three cards, and putting two cards from my hand back on top of my library. I then play an island from the top of my library, and cast Outlaw Stitcher from Exile, making two clues and creating a 2-2 zombie token with 10 plus 1 plus 1 counters on it since I cast 5 spells before the Outlaw this turn. Then I cast a Surge of Brilliance from Exile, making two more clues and drawing a card for each spell I've cast from anywhere other than my hand this turn, which is currently 8. Once that's resolved, I cast Lock and Load, drawing a card for each instant and sorcery I've cast this turn, which is 6. After that, I cast Mind's Desire, shuffling my library and exiling the top card, being able to cast it this turn. Then, since it also has Storm, I copy it for each spell I've cast before it this turn, copying it a total of 9 times. This has me exiling Milliken, Ominous Seas, Hypocrisite, Oracle's Vault, Flow of Knowledge, Inevitable Betrayal, Reality Shift, Reenact the Crime, Prof's Eidetic Memory, and an Island. Once all of that has resolved, I'm able to cast Ominous Seas from Exile, making two clue tokens, and putting a four shadow counter on it whenever I draw a card, letting me remove eight counters to create an 8-8 Kraken. I also cast Milliken from Exile, making two clues, cast Apocrisite from Exile, making two clues, cast Oracle's Vault from Exile, making two clues, and I also cast Inevitable Betrayal from Exile, making two clues and searching Luke's library for a creature, specifically Body of Knowledge, putting it into play under my control. Once that's resolved, I cast Prof's Eidetic Memory from Exile, making two clues, drawing a card, and when I move to combat, putting a number of plus one plus one counters on target creature equal to the number of cards I've drawn this turn. After that, I cast Flow of Knowledge from Exile, making two clues and drawing a card for each island I control, which is 10. Then I cast Reenact the Crime from Exile, making two more clues and exiling a card in a graveyard that was put there this turn, copying it and casting it for free, and that just so happens to be Mind's Desire, casting it, copying it 17 times for Storm, and exiling Ancestral Vision, Temporal Fissure, Intrude on the Mind, Flow of Ideas, Magus of the Future, Jace Reawakened, Midnight Clock, Chaos Wand, Step Between Worlds, Counterbalance, Mystic Sanctuary, Nadir Kraken, Lonely Sandbar, Lone Shark, and Four Islands. At this point I'm able to cast Counterbalance, Nadir Kraken, Jace Reawakened, Magus of the Future, Midnight Clock, and Chaos Wand all from Exile, making 12 more clue tokens. Then I also cast Ancestral Vision from Exile, making two more clues and drawing three cards, and cast Lone Shark from Exile, making two more clues and drawing another card. Once all of that has resolved, I'm able to cast Temporal Fissure, returning target permanent to its owner's hand, then since it has Storm, I copy it 25 times, returning Luke's only blocker to his hand, and all of Doodle and Paul's permanence. Finally, I'm able to move to combat, putting 32 plus 1 plus 1 counters on Fibblethip, using him to knock Luke out of the game, and since they have no permanence at this point, Paul and Doodle both decide to concede rather than having Fibblethip knock them out on the next two turns, winning me the game. Alright, so that was a sweet game. There was definitely a lot going on throughout the course of that game. I think starting with Luke's deck, we got to see the pingers in action, which was very, very cool. We unfortunately didn't get to see any payoffs except for Vigor, and like I mentioned in the gameplay, we unfortunately misplayed Vigor as the game went on. We, for some reason, we thought it could target itself, and it actually cannot with its ability, so that was something that may have made a difference throughout the course of the game. Moving on to Paul's Greven deck... 
he really struggled to get any creatures into play that weren't Greven. He kind of kept having to sacrifice smaller things or things that he didn't actually want to sacrifice if he could find creatures at all. So he really struggled to get going and then eventually able to put himself in a more commanding position and unfortunately lost Greven and things kind of went out of control from there for him. And then Doodle, of course, his Flyers deck did very well. I think he suffered from a lot of removal at the table, and whether it was blocking or getting his stuff pinged down by Luke's things, he really struggled to keep a huge board state, and I think that really is what started to get him. I think that if he'd had more time to set up, he probably could have done a pretty good job, but unfortunately it wasn't in the cards for this one. And then last but not least, of course, our deck and the winning deck at the table, we were able to take down the victory. I think overall, I was very, very impressed with Fibblethip. This was my first time playing a plot deck in Commander, and it really just exceeded my expectations. I assumed that because we were putting a bunch of value into, well, not into play, but into exile in a way that our opponents could see and that they couldn't interact with, I kind of just assumed people would attack us down because of that. But as weird as it is, I think people saw that and because we weren't actually adding anything to the board state, we didn't look nearly as threatening as we actually were. However, I would say in the future, if you do decide to put this deck together, I would recommend putting in something like a Psychosis Crawler or a Body of Knowledge. I think that those would be great additions to this deck in ways that I didn't anticipate building it, because I didn't anticipate us drawing quite that many cards in one turn, so... It just adds more win conditions to the deck, and it's something that could make it run a little bit more efficiently and effectively. So thank you all so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed the video. If you have any suggestions for future cards you'd like to see me build around, please do put them in the comments. I try to get to all of them when I can, but of course, if you want a guarantee, then do check out our Patreon and right here on YouTube as a channel member as well. So once again, thank you all so much for watching, thank you for liking the video, subscribing to the channel, and I will see you all on the other side of the Dungeon Learner's Guide.